Well, hello again. Welcome back to Following to Lead with Kevin East. I'm still Kevin East. Thanks again for joining me on this podcast this week. As always, my mission today, my hope today is to inspire you to follow Jesus in such a way that it changes you, changes the way that you live and the way that you lead both at work and at home. And so each Monday we drop new podcasts like we've been doing for a couple years now, interviewing all sorts of great people that are following Jesus and doing something as a result, probably differently than the way you'd see the world doing it. Um, today I got to interview a new friend. His name is Shane Pruitt. This guy is a, the, uh, the National Next Gen Director for the North American Mission Board. And so I know the North American Mission Board is something I greatly respect, have friends that are missionaries through that organization. And uh, Shane is one of those. He, he travels around as a, an evangelist. He speaks. He writes. Um, he writes all sorts of stuff in his blog and articles he's written that have been picked up by all sorts of different news things uh, in our country here. So Great guy. Uh, oddly enough, we found out in our first few minutes of talking, he actually lives right around the corner from my parents in the Dallas area. And so that was a small world reality. But um, here's what I'd encourage you to do. If you're, if you're interested in this, I'd encourage you to keep listening to this podcast. Um, if you're interested in hearing about the way the next generation is thinking, specifically Gen Z, young people today, if you're interested in hearing how they're thinking, um, maybe how to speak to them about biblical truth um, and what that looks like, then I think you'd really enjoy this, uh, this interview that I just did with him because he, he, th- he talked about some great stuff. Um, when asked about the secret sauce to speaking to Gen Z, he was like, quit asking me that question. <laughs> I actually said, he said, that's a stupid question, but he didn't quite say that. But, but he did have some great insight about speaking and inspiring and building into Gen Z. He's written books as a result of that. So here's my conversation with Shane Pruitt. Hope you really enjoy it. Man, Shane Pruitt. I am so glad you're here. Thanks for taking a few minutes to be on the podcast today, man. Hey, Kevin. It's an honor to be on. Thanks for having me. Now, we were talking right before we hit record. We are actually neighbors, kind of. Yeah. I'm um, talking. You live in the Dallas area. As we talked, you live right around the corner from my parents in the Dallas area. How random is that? <laughs> yeah, no doubt, man. And I think we both discovered there's a chance we may have like passed each other running. And I would guess exactly you, would, right. you would probably be running a lot faster than me. Yeah, uh, for sure. No, not at all. Not anymore. That's for sure. Yeah. But anyway, man, so good to have you here. I, one of the things I'm excited about talking to you about, Shane, is I know with your role with the North American Mission Board, you know, you are really spending your time and energy on the road speaking and writing. You speak to hundreds of thousands of people a year. I mean, all sorts of stuff you're doing. And there are people like me that get to work with young people that are that have kids um, or maybe they're leaders of organizations, businesses, nonprofits that have young people on their staff that need to learn how best to know what they're thinking and how they're responding and just all that type of stuff. So Maybe first of all, just tell me this, you know, you're out there doing that. Um, tell me what's rewarding to you or challenging about working with young people specifically these days. Yeah, Kevin, I love it. You know, in my role in NAM, you know, the official title doesn't really mean anything, but that title is National Next Gen Director. So it means I oversee kind of our ministry efforts to young adults, college students and teenagers. Um, and then really our, our kind of focus in that is, yes, the students themselves but really to equip the equippers of that generation, or what I say to influence the influencers of that generation. You know, so those young adult pastors, college pastors, student pastors. And so we love the next generation. We love those who are uh, equipping the next generation. And we always say, it feels like you're a part of this ancient work of God. One of my favorite verses is Psalm 145.4 that says, One generation shall declare the mighty acts of God to the next generation. So if you think about it, even the reason that you and I are here, Kevin, as believers, is because we're standing on the shoulders of faithful men and women from generation to generation that were faithful to point the next generation to God. And that generation rose up and pointed the next generation to God. And that generation rose up and pointed the next generation to God. And so on and so on and so on. And so especially next-gen leaders, you know, I think we love to be innovative and creative and think outside the box. Uh, but I also tell them, hey, remember, like, we don't start anything. We don't end anything in this ancient story of God. It's just our turn to be faithful, to point yeah, Gen Z right. to the mighty acts of God. So hopefully they'll raise up and point the alpha generation to the mighty acts of God and so you on know, and so on. Yeah, It's funny, Shane, as you say that Psalm 145, verse 4, your favorite verse, what hangs above my fireplace Psalm 71, 17, and 18 that ends, Oh God, do not forsake me and, until I proclaim your might to the next generation, your power to all those to come. Oh, yeah. And I, I have it. that hanging about my fireplace because it's yeah. like as a dad of five kids, like, Lord, 
don't <laughs> let me quit breathing until I can make clear to them just the awesome works you've so done, good. what I've seen, how you've seen you be faithful. So, yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this: is your is your work with young people? I've been able to work with college students for twenty five years now, or something sure. like that, but I've never really tried to notice like. What's different today um, about young people, the way they're thinking? Um, Mm -hmm. So for us as parents or business ministry leaders, help us, help catch this up. How would you describe the differences of how young people are thinking today, maybe versus 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, I love that question, Kevin. Well, I would say this, just in encouragement, especially on the Christian side of things, is that um, there's some similarities with Gen Z that we've seen for 2,000 years. Meaning, you know, I, I think the number one question I get a lot is like, hey, Shane, what's the secret sauce of reaching Gen Z? And I would say really the secret sauce is there is no secret sauce, you know? So the same yeah. gospel that has worked for 2,000 years still works today. The same Bible that has been relevant for a long time is still relevant today. The Holy Spirit inside of us as believers, here's company, wants to reach the next generation even more than we do. You know, so we get to be yeah. vehicles really of the power of the Holy Spirit. I think the differences are, especially with Gen Z, is obviously because of the internet, because they are a digital generation, they're more globally minded. I think sometimes that might can confuse some of the older generation, especially in the United States, because I think they look at Gen Z and go, oh, they're not patriotic. And in a sense, it's not that they don't. Uh, value America. It's just that they tend to value all countries the same. You know what I mean? And so they're very interested in what's going on in Africa, just like they are in the U.S. So they're very interested in what's going on in Europe, like they are in the U.S. In fact, uh, I was on the road, um, you know, um, uh, at the time of this recording uh, last week, and the first person to tell me about Queen Elizabeth's death was my 16-year-old daughter. Like, she texts me immediately, you know, because she's aware of what's going Gosh, on. Gosh, you know what, Shane? Yeah. My 16-year-old son texted me as well. That's how I found out about it. Yeah. So how they're more globally minded, which I think sometimes we look at that, we might get annoyed to go, oh, we well, don't care about you know, our nation, the United States, I think as the church or even as a business, we can utilize that to go, Hey, well, the great commission tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. So let's take that globally minded generation and mobilize them. Uh, also another one is they're very cause oriented. They want their life to matter. They want their life to count. And I think once again, especially in the Christian space, we can go, well, there's not a greater cause than the kingdom of God. There's not a greater cause than helping people know their creator uh, and experience eternal life. So mobilizing. So in that, I would say even in businesses, churches, they're not good at sitting on the sideline. I always say Gen Z, um, they're really not scared to die young, but they are terrified of boredom. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, it, and typically they're bored because we don't think they can do much. So we just kind of sit on the side. So I, I think with businesses, churches, I always say, if you have that mindset of young people need to be seen and not heard, they won't be seen nor heard because they won't be around. They want to sit at the you table. Know, and they want to that's be right. Yeah. I think that's really good. I, I was thinking about, I had a lunch with a friend of mine the other day and he was saying to me, and I didn't think about it until afterwards how much it stuck out to me, but he said, you know, I've given my kids three options. You can be a, a doctor, a lawyer, or a dentist, I think was the other one. Like, that's it, basically. And mm-hmm. and when you're saying young people today, they want to make a difference. They want to be a part of a cause. Yeah. Uh, even if our kids may be interested in being a dentist, there might be a way to present that that's through the exactly. cause of helping people and serving no people, doubt. not just yeah. go make a bunch of money. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, you know, and, and you see that. You see young people going, all right, hey, yeah, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a dentist. I want to be a doctor you know, so on and so on. And to know that, hey, there's a way, first of all, that you can use that to live on mission in your business. But there's also a way to use those gift sets to use some of your vacation days to go help countries that don't have access to those same things. Yeah. And then I'd say the third thing that's probably different about Gen Z than previous generation is um, the rate of Gen Zers who say they struggle with depression and anxiety is just out of control. You know, we're um, even with uh, millennials, you are hovering around probably 10 to 12 percent. I mean, with Gen Z, even before the pandemic, I, Kevin, I think a lot of people, we blame the pandemic. I always say this, the pandemic didn't necessarily create new problems. It just poured gasoline on the problems we already had. Because even mm-hmm. with Gen Z, roughly 20 percent of Gen Z said they were struggling with some kind of mental health issue before the pandemic. Since the pandemic and through the pandemic, it's now raising to around 40 percent. So wow. I think mental health is an area that churches, ministry, and businesses are going to have to be very aware of and even have helps for people that are part of their churches or even help have helps for young people who are your employees. Yeah. 
You know, I really like that, Shane. I hadn't thought about that for our staff here at the ministry that I lead about what I can do to really build into health. Um, we talk a lot about social, emotional health. Sure. Um, but I think that's another one we can really pour into. So you're pointing out three good things. First of all, you, well, four things. The first one being you're telling people secrets. Don't ask about the secret sauce. That's a stupid question. I'm going <laughs> to quote Shane Pruda. <laughs> Maybe not in so many words, but somewhat something yeah. like that. But yeah. Gen Z, you're pointing out, man, they're global thinkers. They want to be a part of yeah. a cause. And you know what? Depression, anxiety, it's a real thing for them. Mm-hmm. Pre-pandemic, 20% jumped up to 40% after it. Yeah. Tell me this, Shane, when you're speaking at groups, because I know you do that a lot, when you... Are there certain messages you come back to while you're speaking in speaking that you go, I just know this is going to resonate, whether I'm in Idaho For or sure. in Florida or whatever. Are there certain themes you're coming back to as you speak? Yeah, for sure. Um, identity is huge. Um, I think a lot of what Gen Z is struggling with, there's a lot of confusion. I think we know this about sexuality. There's a lot of confusion about gender. So just really a lot of identity talk, identity in Christ, fulfillment. Uh, there's just a, a statement that I've just been bannering all this year that has really seemed to resonate with young people is that you'll always feel like something is missing in your life as long as someone is missing in your life and his name is Jesus. Um, because mm-hmm. uh, even Wall Street Journal put out uh, uh, some stats last year about that, you know, less than 30% of Gen Z says religion is important to them. So if that be true, then statistically speaking, Gen Z is the least religious generation we've ever seen in the United States. However, um, over 80% says living a self-fulfilled life is important to them. So I feel like that's the area where we can press in with the gospel. That's the threshold to cross to go, hey, your creator wants you to live a fulfilled life as well. You're just not going to find that inside of you. You're going to find that in someone who's bigger than you. And he's the yeah. King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, you know? Yeah, um, so I, I like think that. that resonates. Yeah. You'll yeah. always feel another... like something is missing as long as someone is missing. I like yeah, that. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say something Yeah, else. and then I think the other ones too, um, what is real biblical love look like? You know, because I think love is thrown around, you know, uh, you even see just shirts everywhere, love is love. Um, you know, I, I heard someone say, you can tell culture has lost the definition of a word when you have to use the word to define the word, <laughs> you know? So that's like saying a car yeah. is a car that doesn't really help. Right. So yeah. what does real biblical love look like? And then, um, and then the third one that really resonates is just truth. What is real truth? Is there still absolute truth? Is there still authoritative truth? Um, uh, it's a truth hungry generation. Um, They don't trust anything. They don't trust the news. They don't trust social media. They don't trust institutions. So I think sometimes even as a church or an organization, that's another barrier because they tend to look at us as an institution. So like, what is real truth look like? Um, Yeah. So yeah, those three areas for sure. In Following to Lead, we talk about following Jesus each week. And as we follow Jesus, how it changes us, the way that we live and the way that we lead. It's what I say each time as I open up this podcast. It's one thing to talk about it. It's something Something completely different to live it out. So I want to tell you about this ministry I get to lead called Mentoring Alliance. Mentoring Alliance is a Christ-centered ministry that supports children and families in the communities that we have the privilege of serving. We say it like this here, that we exist to mobilize godly people into the lives of kids and families to provide tangible help and eternal hope. We do summer camps, after-school programs, and we connect godly people as mentors one-on-one with at-risk kids in these communities. You know, if you're passionate about helping kids and families from all different parts of communities, I'd invite you to join us here at Mentoring Alliance. You can find us at TheMentoringAlliance.com. If you'd be willing to help support it financially, that would be great as well. You can do that at TheMentoringAlliance.com slash donate. Again, that's TheMentoringAlliance slash donate. Okay, I like that. And you, I know you've written some books. Um, one of the books you've written, you, you mentioned that young people today are hungry for truth. And so I want to kind of stop and sit on this for a second. You talked about uh, one of your books is titled Nine Common Lies Christians Believe. Um, talk about, throw out a few of these. I want to, I want to hear what these things are. Um, give me an sure. example of one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the theme of the book is really that there's these cultural cliches that we as the church, for lack of a better term, have adopted, baptized them, and made them a part of our vernacular, but they're not biblically true. So several (laughs) of them are, you know, I wrote on nine of them. Unfortunately, we could probably write on 99 of them, you know, Um, but a couple of them, you know, are like, um, you know, God won't give you more than you can handle. Uh, If a loved one dies, God gains another angel. Uh, believe in yourself, uh, follow your heart. God just wants me to be happy. 
Um, you know, God yeah. doesn't care about me. Um, so each one of those takes, uh, each chapter takes one of those kind of cliches. And then what does the Bible actually have to teach about that and a better truth to move forward with? Um, and Kevin, before we hit record, you shared a little bit of your story. Um, yeah. We have a, a, a similar story, um, you know, that's not a cancer story, but our son suffers from seizures every day. So really okay. this book is from an outflow of that because we always had well-meaning people. And that's the key. I don't want to be snarky with these, yeah. but well-meaning people. People who are basically just regurgitating cliches that probably other people shared with them. And, you yeah. know, it's watching our son suffer every day. You know, people go, well, you know what the Bible says? God won't give you more than you can handle. And you're like, well, the Bible doesn't say that, you know. <laughs> or, you know, if God calls him home, that means he just needs another angel. And you're like, well, the oh, Bible definitely doesn't teach that. So it's just yeah. it's sometimes just being honest. I think some of our biggest problems uh, in the church is really just we don't know the Bible very well, you know. Yeah. Um, and we just I revert bet, to cliches that we hear. Yeah. And I bet for young people, correct me if I'm wrong, but knowing how hungry they are for truth, knowing that young people value authenticity, sincerity, qualities like that. When you stand up on stage and say, let me tell you something, you know, the Bible does not say this. I know you've yeah. probably heard it a thousand times. Mm -hmm. It's probably like fresh water to their souls where they're like, no finally, doubt. somebody's cutting past all the garbage that I'm hearing and, and speaking to me about real stuff here. Yeah, no doubt. And I think with the Bible, is, you know, we have an opportunity to cut through the noise because that's another question I get, Kevin, you know, with young people who go, OK, with how loud culture is, how loud social media is, how loud, you know, all these things are and distractions. How do you cut through the noise? And I always say, uh, preach the Bible because yeah. like no one else is doing that. You know what I mean? And so like I always say, so if they come into your church or they come into your Bible studies or your small groups, if it gets to the teaching time. And all they really hear is a self-help pep talk with Bible verses sprinkled out of context because we're trying to dumb it down for them. I always say, don't dumb it down. Disciple them up. They can handle it. Meaning, if they can handle some algebra, they can handle some doctrine and theology. You know what I mean? And so, mm -hmm. like, if we just do this self-help pep talk with Bible verses sprinkled out of context, then for lack of a better term, it just sounds like white noise to them because that's literally what they hear everywhere else. Like, if they go to a public that's school right. or a public university, that's the posters they're going to see in the hallway is all the self-help. That's what they're going to see on social media. If they come from a non-Christian background or family, that's what they've heard growing up and what their parents tell them. So if they hear that at church, it just sounds like everything else. However, if it gets to that teaching time, we open God's word, Genesis through Revelation, and we go, hey, here's what the Bible teaches. The world is jacked up. We're jacked up. But there is a hope, and his name is Jesus, and we teach the whole counsel of God, then that does cut through the white noise because they do not hear that anywhere else. And what I found, you know, because like you mentioned so well, Kevin, is a core value of young people is that rawness, that authenticity. So what I found is even if they don't agree with you, or maybe they don't even like what you're saying at first, there is this respect because you're not trying to bait and switch them. You're just saying, here's yeah. what we believe. And it's not my opinions. It's not my agenda. It's what this Bible says that we center our faith on, you know? Yeah, that's really good. And so as you're jumping through those things, you know, believe in your heart, I, I have to tell you, I used, I used to hire a lot of college kids from all over the yeah. country. And every April, um, they would start calling. Some of them would call, and they'd say, hey, I just don't have a piece about being there this summer. <laughs> and I'd go, oh, my gosh, I forgot it's April. And, and, yeah. and my point to them was, this is a very common thing that happens in April because they're used to the idea of following their heart um, mm -hmm. as opposed to protecting their heart. They used to think, okay, my heart's going to kind of direct my path here as opposed to, yeah. Lord, I'm, I trust you and, and I'm following you in that. So let me ask you this. You have a new book coming out. Um, yeah. November 1st, I believe you told me ahead of time, um, about calling out the called. Um, explain this book. Why, why do you put it together? I think it's about the idea of investing in kind of the leaders that are investing in others. Yeah. Is, is that what it is? Talk about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Too. Yeah, yeah. So calling out the called, uh, discipling those called to ministry leadership. Yeah, in there we break down really like, you know, that there's really three types of callings you see in the Bible. First of all, a calling unto the Lord for salvation. And then once you've been bought by the blood of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit of God. There's two types of callings. You see a unique calling and a universal calling. A universal calling on all believers. Now, not universalism, that's heresy. But what I mean, right. a universal calling, meaning this, if you've been bought by the blood of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit of God. Um, you are called to know Jesus and make Jesus known. You are called to live on mission anywhere 
uh, where there's ground between your two feet. That ground between your two feet is your mission field. That's called. That's where you're called to know Jesus, make Jesus known. So your school, your jobs, your neighborhoods, the nations, your family. But then there in the Bible, you see a unique calling on some to leadership. And you really see the, the kind of really both broken down in uh, Ephesians um, 11 and 12, you know, where it goes through and goes, some are apostles, evangelists, leaders, you know, past. basically it's going through a list of leaders and their job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, the saints are all believers. So that's universal, you know, a universal calling on all believers, meaning all saints are called to ministry. But then God's called some to be leaders, and their job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And I think in our churches and our ministry, we've, you know, um, we always got room to grow, but I think there's been a big focus the last probably two decades on, you know, like that mindset of every member a missionary, every member a minister. We're all called to live on mission. We're all called to ministry. And that's great, but I think what we've gotten away from is that unique calling on some to ministry leadership. And so you got scary, you know, just being honest, some scary stats out there that says, you know, there's more Protestant leaders over the age of 65 than under the age of 40. And I think it's because we've gotten away from calling young people um, to leadership. And I don't believe God has stopped calling. I think we've stopped asking and we've stopped Mm. equipping. You know, uh, every week I probably get two to three calls from churches looking for college pastors, looking for youth pastors, looking for other staff members. Um, and there just seems to be a shortage. In fact, I speak at a lot of chapels at Christian universities. And so I know even, you know, some Christian universities, they'll have 5,000 students on campus and only about 40 of those students are in their ministry leadership track, you know, or Mm -hmm. going there to be, you know, leaders in the church. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's an area where I think we got to get back to that and young people can handle it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I want to talk to you about what it looks like to be equipping. Um, before I yeah. come to that, you know, you, you talk about Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. When I was a young person, it, it, I've mentioned it before on the podcast because it so stuck out to me. My my senior pastor called me in his office one day. I was a young student pastor. Yeah. He's like, what's your job here? I said, like, well, I'm the high school student pastor. No, that's your title. What's your job here? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm over like the Wednesday night meeting. and this, No, that's what mm-hmm. you do each week. What's your job here? And I was like, okay, you obviously have a an answer to a question. I don't know what <laughs> it is. he's waiting for, yeah. And he said, your job is Ephesians 4.11. He said, your job is some, you got to raise some to, be, to prepare people to be, for, to, he raised up these people, pastors, apostles, prophets, yes. teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service. Your job here is to prepare God's people for works of service. I and as a it. young 22, 23 year old, I'm still talking about it today. I'll put it like that. It was such a it was such it. a memorable thing for me. Yes. So for you, Shane, give us give us wisdom. For those who are like, Man, okay, how do I start equipping the next generation, whether it be in my workplace, in my own home? What are some tips you might give that could help people do that? Yeah, I think first and foremost, we, we got to start asking again. Um, you think if, even in a ministry context is, um, and I know you've done a lot with Christian camps, is, you know, even you think of a youth camp in the summer, typically uh, there's at least one night of calling out the call, right? Where you're calling people to surrender to call a ministry on their life or call to missions on their life. And so we'll do it at like camps or conferences, but when's the last time you've been in a local church service and they did that? You know, so on yeah. some level, we've gotten away from doing that in the local church. So I think this is, truly is an area where we have not because we ask not. And so I think we need to start asking again, giving people an opportunity to uh, to surrender that call in their life. I don't believe, like I said, I don't believe God stopped calling people. I think we've stopped asking. Um, and so, you know, whether that's in a public invitation or if you're, you know, uh, in a business world, you see a, a, a person thriving and kind of rising to the top and you see leadership potential in them. You see humility in them. You see teachability in them. Uh, you see others tend to follow them. Uh, I, I call it that tap on the shoulder to go, hey, do you feel like maybe God's calling you to leadership or you feel like you've been equipped to this? Or do you feel like God's calling you to be on staff for a nonprofit or a ministry or a church? Or, or you feel, you know, that you can be a leader here in this, this job or in this business is we got to get better at asking. And then when people go, I really do see that myself. Then I think we got to be very intentional with them to give them opportunities uh, to lead and opportunities to fail. Cause sometimes we're going to have our greatest teaching moments when we fail. Um, I think we yeah. tend to think, especially with young people, that they can't do anything. And I think it's sad. You think if we go back to the church 
you know, world. It, and it says sometimes culture understands the power of young people more than the church does. Because if you think of culture, 15 year olds are already creating their own brands on social media. 16 year olds are operating motor vehicles. 17 year olds are in the workforce. 18 year olds are serving in the military, holding weapons, protecting our freedoms. 19 year olds and 20 year olds, college students are creating businesses and nonprofits. But, and then the church, we don't think they can do anything. So I'm, yeah. what I mean by that is if they can do those things, they can also be the church right now. They can serve, they can lead, they can have a seat at the table. Will they mess up? Yes. Will they let you down? Yes. Will they show up late? Probably. But those are opportunities. <laughs> those are opportunities yeah. to disciple them and teach them just yeah. like others have done for us. You know, Man, that is so good. I could not amen you loud enough. I, I yeah. tell parents when I'm teaching on parenting, I think we aim way too low with our kids and we yeah. just... We don't expect enough out of them, not in the sense of like, you can make better grades, but like, we don't call them out to something more. And what you're right. saying is ask, how can people, you know, uh, equip them, ask them, you know, get them out. I mean, ask them to step yep. up to something more, give them opportunities to lead, knowing they'll fail or show up late, either yeah. one. And that's okay. Yeah. It's an opportunity to teach and yeah. disciple the midst of that. Yeah, that's no good. doubt. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So let me ask you this as we wrap up here. You have a podcast called Next Gen on Mission. You have this book calling it, um, coming out November the 1st called calling out the called and what's the subtitle of it again yeah discipling those called to ministry leadership yeah yeah that's so yeah. good mm -hmm. um if people want to hear more from you i'm assuming the podcast talk about that or where they can find your books just help help everybody build a connect with you yeah right? sure yeah the books are available everywhere books are sold uh our podcast next gen on mission are, is available on all podcast platforms. And basically the idea of Next Gen on Mission is a little short, 20 to 25 minute conversations between myself, our co-hosts. We usually invite in guests. And it's really over all the things we've just been talking about, uh, reaching, discipling, mobilizing the next generation to be the right now church. So really what we believe, our tagline is like, you know, we always say they're the future of the church. And I know what you mean by that. Future leaders, pastors, influencers, sure. But really theologically, if they've been bought by the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God, they are not the future of the church. They are the church right now. So how do we right. help equip them to be the church right now? So that's really the mindset of the podcast, Next Gen Mission. And then, yeah, on social media, uh, just at Shane underscore Pruitt, P-R-U-I-T-T 78. And that's usually putting out a lot of content through social media. So, yeah, those are just multiple it. areas to connect. Would love to connect with you. Well, Shane, you're a good man, and you, man, you inspire me and with all you're doing and who all you're speaking to and how you're writing and stuff like that. So, again, thanks for taking the time to be here today, man. Really good chatting with you today. Man, it's an honor. It's been a blast, Kevin. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of Following to Lead. Uh, be sure to check out our show notes. Uh, we're always in putting in there links to resources in there, so make sure you check those out. Or you can find them on our website at followingtolead.com. Hey, uh, if you want to ever catch up with me personally, connect with me on Instagram at Kevin T. East or on Facebook. Or you can even find our Following to Lead with Kevin East Facebook site there as well. We're always posting uh, fun resources there as well. Hey, uh, let me leave you these last four words as I always do. Follow Jesus. Leave the